Nothing makes me feel more nostalgic than a trip to Grandma's house. The sounds of Tucker Carlson screaming at full volume, the smell of expired blood thinners, and seeing those creepy porcelain German children in various states of uh, bizarre play. Well, those terrifying tots are called Hummels. And not only are they worth a pretty penny, they were once the bane of Adolf Hitler's existence. Oh yes, the history of Hummel figurines on this week's This Was a Thing. This was a thing. This was a thing. This was a thing. Don't you remember? Jackie Robinson swing going my way with Bing and the friendly spring of a slinky toy or color TV screens jukebox machines tiny Hummel figurines this was a thing this was a thing Hi, I'm Ray. And I'm Rob. And you are listening to This Was a Thing, the podcast that dives deep into the cultural happenings of yesteryear. On today's episode, we are looking at Hummel figurines. Hummel figurines represent one of the finest and most cherished gifts in the world. Made to the highest standard of European craftsmanship, each Hummel scene is a treasured gift in every home. From Italy, hand-carved maple comes to life in the hands of the craftsmen of Henri. Gentle expressions lovingly rendered touch the heart of the beholder. You'll enjoy giving the true gift of tradition. This was a thing because it was these little porcelain figures that made our grandmothers the OG in catching them all. Funko Pops, Pokemon. Pokemons, Beanie Babies, Cabbage Patch Dolls, they have nothing on Hummel figurines. And unlike those Switzerlands of collectibles that I just mentioned, these figures found themselves to be a massive F.U. to Adolf Hitler. Didn't know Grandma was so subversive, did you? So today we're going to be talking about Hummel figurines. Now, you might not know what a Hummel figurine is by name, but I'm sure you have seen it in your grandmother or aunt's house. A Hummel figurine are these like 10-inch little porcelain figurines of German children, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, in lederhosen, Ooh. in various states of the play. Some of them are sitting on the trees, some of them are sitting at the lake. Von blonde hair, blue-eyed, perfect German children, children. children. Von is giving a little kiss to the girl. Ooh, kissy, kissy. Anyway, if you've seen them, they've got, your, your grandma probably has tons of them. There's over like a thousand of them you can possibly collect. Ludwig and Toady Boy on the mushroom. Toady Boy? Toady Boy, he's his little toad friend. I thought he was no, a dirty it's, boy. No, Toady Boy is a dirty boy because he's a toad and he's always going all over the mud. You're a horrible person. Oh, I don't know. Is it me or Toady Boy? We're just going to a mushroom up stop pose. <laughs> Okay, so maybe you have seen these. So very quickly, just so you're all aware, I did some research on these Hummels. He's writing a screenplay. I'm writing a screenplay. First of all, every time you see a boy and a girl in these Hummels, they all look the same. It's a little German girl, and the guy looks like her gay best friend. And they all look very sassy. Like, the guys and the girls are, like, very bitchy and sassy and all these things. The back patch on my later hosen's for later. There's a figurine of called Just Fishing. <laughs> And it's these two guys. They look like twinks that are going to go fuck in the woods. I'm fishing. One is called Apple Tree Boy. And it's like a twink in an apple tree branch. And I'm like, this is a grinder pick. I'm going to fall from this branch any second. Then there's Hummel figurines where it's based on occupations. One is called Waiter. And he's dressed <laughs> like a waiter. Apparently they didn't have child labor laws in Germany at this time. And he looks sad. Well, of course he is. He's a child having to wait, serve tables, not getting good tips. He was taken out of school to just serve you food. Then there's one called Surprise. And, it's, <laughs> and, and they have it's these two figures, and they look like those relatives that show up that you always hate when they show up. Surprise, we're here. Then there's one called Doctor, and it's a little, it's a five-year-old dressed as a doctor, but at his feet is a little porcelain baby. 
And I'm like, did he drop the baby? <laughs> like, did did he drop it because they tried to have a five year old? I'm sorry, the little Hummel mothers didn't make it through childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> There's also one called Little Lawyer, which I call Salino and Barnes Jr. <laughs> and then my personal favorite, this one was called a Goose Girl. And it's a little girl, and a goose is lifting up her skirt. And so you can see, like, her pantaloons. But she seems to like it. Like, the figurine isn't like, oh, don't do that. The figurine's like, yeah, go higher. Excuse me. Uh, you have, have the Hummels for sale here? <laughs> um, uh, just, I have a very specific one that I'm looking for. You want me to describe it? Please. Uh, okay. So, uh, it has this fowl in it. Uh, you could call it a goose. I just did a spit take. I'm sorry. Continue on while I clean myself up. And uh, so, okay, how do I put this? So, uh, it's a Hummel. I don't know how I describe what the Hummel looks like. Um, Is it a boy, a girl? Uh, well, they all kind of look the same, but I guess you'd wear it. they'd be wearing a dress. Okay, so the goose is putting his nose up the girl's dress. Do you have that one? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, if you want to sell it, can, can I go in the bathroom with it for 10 minutes? <laughs> also, do you have a live goose anyway? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to push this along. I apologize. So I got to a point where I was like, what is it about these figurines that I'm going to be honest with you? I think they're kind of tacky and weird. Why is it that so many people want to get their hands on them? So I did some research and I honestly thought when we were gonna when we were gonna do this as, as part of the podcast i thought to myself i was like this i don't know how interesting this is gonna be and this story ray is fascinating of how hummels came to be and what they mean all right so i hope you're enjoying this we're gonna go back to germany in the 1920s let me get my passport <laughs> All right, so we're going back to Germany in the 1920s, and I want to introduce you to a woman. Her name is Berta Hummel, or as she's actually going to be known, Sister Mary Innocentia oh, Hummel. Okay, she was a nun. I think she's such an interesting person. So she has a father. The father, obviously, the <laughs> father wanted to be a sculptor. He couldn't do that. He had to go into business. She wants to be an artist. And her dad is like, hey, listen, I didn't get a chance to do it, but like, go for you. Like, you you do it. In the 20s? That's pretty crazy, I feel like. Yeah. And, you know, she, Burtis said, like, <laughs> I like this quote. She says that she grew up in a warm, loving, quote, nest of Hummels, <laughs> meaning her family was supportive. Also, some really cool things about Berta. She was doing things women at this time were not doing. So after her parents were like, yeah, go be an artist, she graduated from Munich's Academy of Applied Arts in 1931. So she's a woman that says, I want to go get an education, also really rare at the time. And she had this amazing gift of sketching children. That was like what she was going to become to know for, which is like how the Hummels get involved. And everyone's like, oh, she's going to go live like the bohemian artist's lifestyle. She's going to go to a big city. And she's like, you know what? She goes, I love my art, but I love God more. I want to be a nun. And so she goes into the congregation of the Franciscan sisters in a city called Bad Salgau. Bad Salgau. Where is good Salgau? That was in East Germany. And the reason that she went there is because this, this congregation was like, we really believe in art education. So she was like, okay, I'll be a nun and I can teach and I get to teach the German kids about art. So she was very, very excited about that. So she's at the convent. She's teaching children art at the same time as part of like her jobs and her duties. A lot of the children's are orphans. So she draws them. She draws pictures of them, like, doing things around the school and the park and all that stuff. I need you to go over to that bridge over there. Don't worry. Okay. I need you to take this double barrel shotgun. <laughs> this is this is her early work. <laughs> and I need you to just shoot it right into the pond. <laughs> and this is going to be called gun fishing. <laughs> She's such an angry woman, Berta. No, it's just I want to try out my no medium. <laughs> Sketching. Uh, Berta, the Master Abbas wants to see you. Uh, Berta. Master Abbas? <laughs> I had to climb a mountain to get here. Uh, Berta, some of the parents are complaining. <laughs> Berta, can you explain to me uh, what you're doing with the children? Uh, well, well, Mother Abbas, I'm, I'm using them for, for art. Yes, yes. Uh, what is this painting called? Human centipede. <laughs> They're all wearing lederhosen, and so. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, these drawings, these drawings that she's doing, people are like, "Oh my god, they're amazing!" The convent starts putting 
the drawings onto postcards. Postcards were like really popular at the time. And this guy named Emil Fink Verlag was like, hey, I really like the postcards you're doing for the convent. Can I take them from you and sell them to like gift shops? And she's like, yeah, okay. okay." The convent's like, yeah, she can do it. But she doesn't get any of the money. It's God's money. Okay, God made these children. She's making pose on bridges and on top of mushroom toad. So now, now these postcards are like all over Germany. And if like you go visit Germany, you send the postcard out. And people are like, oh, this is really cool. And people in America are like, what the fuck, fuck is, is this? this? Now, these postcards, they catch the eye of a guy named Franz Goebel. <laughs> no, not that one. And he's a porcelain manufacturer. And he says, oh, my God, I really love these uh drawings i want to make them into figurines and he says can i make them into figurines and she's like no i don't really feel right about that and he's like okay that's fine then my company will just go under and all my employees will be fired (laughs) she's like oh okay (laughs) he literally says that to her he says if you don't give me this it goes everything's gonna they're gonna all be unemployed so the convent (laughs) then sells gobel the rights to the fi- I'm like, is this woman making any money from what she's creating? The convent is all of a sudden like fucking William Morris this over is here. This insane. So this guy, Goebel, he takes the figurines that he makes and he puts them at the Leipzig Trade Fair in 1935, which apparently was this very big trade fair in Europe. And all of these people that are from all over the world that are looking at these things are like, these are really cute. These are really interesting. How do we get, how do we get these? So by the end of 1935, <laughs> there's like 46 Hummel motifs on the market, and then American distributors in Chicago and New York picked them up. So when did they first get released, the actual porcelain? Around 1935. Okay, so in 10 years, they had 46 figures. Yeah, which okay. is... Well, I mean, no, I mean, for back then, yeah, like oh my a God. mold alone would cost a lot for that kind of stuff. But the big thing is, is they really start to get popular in like the late 40s because U.S. soldiers would bring them back to their oh. wives, their daughters, their moms, because they were sold at all military trading and posts. And so it's huge with baby boomers then. It's really big with baby boomers boomers and that was like the thing like your that makes sense your dad would bring it to you yeah that totally makes right? sense right hey friends hope you're enjoying the show if you are could you do us a favor after you listen to today's episode open up your podcast app and leave us a review please the more reviews we get the more people will discover us and the more people that discover us the less lost we'll feel you're good buddy it's okay uh look nothing has ever been easier to do just go ahead and grab a pen real quick it's okay we'll wait don't worry okay head on over to your podcast app click those three dots in the lower right hand corner click go to show scroll down till you see ratings and reviews then leave us some stars and a comment or two so our parents know that it was worth all the tuition that they spent and if you really love us head on over to patreon.com and send us some money and in return you will get access to merch special episode bonus content pictures of me shirtless okay okay that's p-a-t r-e-o-n dot com search this was a thing and help us out but you know what you've already helped us out today by listening to us and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that so thank you thank you this is where now i'm like this story just took a big turn for me it's 1937 we're still in germany and sister maria berta hummel berta. <laughs> she draws a sketch a painting actually and it's called the volunteers and I'm going to try to describe this to you. It's two three-year-old boys, right? And they're wearing short uh, pants and long-sleeved brown shirts, kind of like Nazis. Is there any gooses? No gooses in this one. Oh, actually, there's a goose step. I was going to say, are they, are they, is there any steps? They are. They're goose stepping. So what they're doing is they're, they're goose stepping in unison. They're wearing combat boots, but the boots have no strings, and like the hair spills out from underneath their caps. Uh, there's a drum that they're, that they're beating, but when you look at it, it's not really a drum. It's a castanet. There's a toy rifle on one of their shoulders, and beneath it, Berta has written, Dear Fatherland, Let There Be Peace. And so what she's doing is, is she can tell, like, the Nazis are coming to power. She's realizing something is going wrong. Liberal wokeness. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Bert. I can't handle this cancel culture of Germany in 1937. <laughs> right? I'll tell you that much. So she makes this painting, and it's very clear. She's like, hey, I don't like the Nazis. Hitler sees this painting, and he denounces it and says, hey, listen, Berta. 
stop doing that because you're portraying our German children as having hydrocephalic heads and you're making them look like club-footed goblins. Ich mean hydrocephalic, ich nein. That was actually exactly what he said, word for word. Yeah, well, that was a clip. That was, that was, that was actually a clip. So the Nazis were like, well, what the hell do we do? So they let her keep working. Like they're like, you can keep creating, but you can't sell or distribute her figurines or her postcards in Germany because Hitler's like, you're making German children look bad and our German children are perfect. Now, here's something that's also interesting. If you were a company that was, was printing her drawings, your paper ration was slashed in half. Wow. So they were like, you're really not going to print any of Sister Berta Hummel's figurines that make fun of the German kids. Wow. Now, here's where I was like, what the fuck is happening? I read this quote. There is no place in the ranks of German artists for the likes of her. No, the beloved fatherland cannot remain calm when Germany's youth or per- are portrayed as brainless sissies. This quote comes from an art review of Berta Hummel in... S.A. Mann, which is a Nazi magazine. So there was a magazine for Nazis that also did art reviews. What other articles are in this Nazi magazine? I'm curious, like, you know how you, they have those Time Life collections <laughs> for CDs? Do you think they have, like, the S.S. Mann Life collection? Goebbels, you think you know him, but let's see the man behind the myth. Dressing for him with Himmler. Let me tell you, I am a proud Jew. I would do anything to get my hands on a copy of this magazine to see what kind of fucked up articles. If they did art reviews, like what, like movie reviews. <laughs> actually, S, what, what was it called? S.A. Mann. I think that actually translates to to Daily Caller? Wow, you learn something new every day. So Berta Hummel is like, fuck this. So she started drawing sketches that contained the Star of David. Oh. She made angels, and the angels had Jewish stars on their gowns. And she symbolized the coming together of the Old Testament and the New Testament by designing a cross with a menorah before it. So she's like, go fuck yourself. She's like, I'm going to, you don't want to sell it? That's fine. I'm going to keep creating it. So by the time we get into the mid forties, the her her work, like the work she's creating, is fading a little bit. And in nineteen forty, the Nazis closed any sort of religious school that would include hers, and they seized her convent. And so, like forty out of the two hundred and fifty sisters, they were allowed to stay, including Maria. She went back to her family for a little bit, and she's like, "I kind of miss the convent, and I know it's different, but I'm going to go back to the convent." So the 40 that got to stay in this convent, which is now owned by the fucking Nazis, they were all given like the smallest section of the convent. They had no heat. There was no heat at all. No means to support themselves. And she volunteered. She's like, put me in the smallest cell. She's like, give me the smallest cell. It'll be my bedroom. It'll also be my art studio. Then she starts to create again. And now the Nazis say, okay, you can keep creating because they see how much money it brings in. But we're going to take half. So she was making more from the Nazis than she was from the church. Well, now, wait a minute. Ready for this? The Nazis are like, we're going to take half of what you make. And then she, they're like, you get the other half. And you know what she does with the other half? She gives it to the convent. But still, she was still making money, even though she gave she gave the money away. Absolutely. But, but still, it, it is, I don't know, for some reason that just is... is it has some kind of it's that's something that yeah. the church wouldn't pay, let her get any money, but the Nazis. Oh yeah, the Nazis were, were like, like, yeah, you we'll know give what? you half. We'll still give you half, right? So anyway, so then it's kind of said in 1946, she's 37 years old and she dies of tuberculosis. So now we're not going to have 37, 37 years old. So now we're not going to get any more Hummels. But this is where now, like the Hummel legacy will continue on, even though that she's gone. So Goebel, the guy who owned the figurine factory, not that one, no, and the sisters of the convent. They're able to keep producing the figurines, and they're going to base them on all the drawings she did because she did like a ton of other drawings that never got released to the public. So they're like, oh, we'll take those, and we'll make new figurines out of it. In fact, her mom won a lawsuit to merchandise all the images of her daughter's work from before she entered into the convent. Oh, wow. Then Hummel sort of fade away just for a little bit. They're not they're not as popular as they once were. And then all of a sudden, in the 1970s, there's this very exciting speculator market. And out of nowhere, they just start to go, oh, Hummels are worth something now. It's, it's just this arbitrary thing that just sort of doesn't mean anything, but it gets accepted as fact. So now all these Hummels start to skyrocket in price. And the Goebel company is like, we need to be making more things. 
if everyone wants to get their hands on these Hummels now, we need to be making more things. So they start to throw in collectible plates where they put like a Hummel figure on a plate and then the plate has a year underneath it. So you can collect 1972 and 73 and 74 and 75. What was your favorite year? 83, because that's the one where um, Twink and the Apple Tree um, goes with the girl and they go to the lake together. Uh, Spoiler alert. And then they put out bells that have Hummels on them, more plates, calendars, cards, and then they put out an official Hummel book. And they say something in the book, which I think is supposed to be read nicely and kindly and warmly. But when I read it, it comes off very aggressive. You will delight in the beauty of the Holy Child. Yes, you will love them all with their round faces and big questioning eyes. Okay, okay, okay. Jesus Christ. That's the last time Tony Kushner writes a forward to a book. <laughs> and then these these other companies sort of pop up with the quote unquote the authentic art of Sister Berta Hummel Trinkets. Now here's the thing where it gets really fucked up and weird. Her name was Maria Innocentia. M.I. If it says Sister Berta M.I. Hummel, if the M.I. is there, it's authentic. These other companies that are like, we're going to just do forgeries of it, just say, well, they're called Sister Berta Hummel Trinkets. We're not going to put the M.I. So they're like, that's how we're going to get around that loophole. Then there's something called, literally, they're Hummel figurines, but they're called the Original Child Life Series from New York. And then there's an um, Our Children Collection from Cleveland. And then another company called Art of Sakura. And they're just flooding the market with Hummels. They're just flooding this fucking market with Hummels because they're like, oh, people want to buy them now. There's no, what is it like the dot, no, the bubble. Uh, the dot com burst. Right? It's like, it's not there. There's nothing there, people. Oh my gosh. In West Germany, there was an annual lookalike contest in the 70s. I was going to say, well, and then they started uh, like making children look like them with the extra saccharin, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because because once yeah once I think wasn't it true after uh, a, a ger- like uh, the Nazis were done they were like well we need to go against everything Hitler said so they wanted to start making German children look like they had the extra saccharin. It's you you know I didn't realize that I didn't study world history the way you did so thank you for that clarification. It was on ancient aliens. <laughs> oh okay thank you. And then back in the seventies and eighties they started like all this limited because edi- you know limited edition like. Remember Disney? It's going back into the vault. Oh, the vault. Oh, yeah. oh. They had all this crap. They thought they could fool the public. And let's be honest, as a general rule, no retailer has ever consistently been able to make money by selling the proposition that his goods are going to increase in value after they're bought. As much as you might say that it's true, it ain't true. Now, this is something that I knew my grandmother was a part of. In 1977, there was the Global Collectors Club. That got founded in the U.S. And the club was to be an information service for the growing number of Hummel collect M.I. Hummel collectors. Okay, M.I. I was say. Legit, babe. Legit. Right? And then a year later, a network of local chapters emerged. And that spread all across North America and the world. And in the local chapters, they got to meet and talk about Hummels. And as uh, the Hummel organization says, you got to meet in person to share knowledge and friendship. What chapter was your grandma part of? Chapter 11 bankruptcy. <laughs> that was the club that had the accountant Hummel figurine, where it's a little five-year-old crying over With an Excel. green visor. <laughs> crying over an Excel uh, spreadsheet. My dicks and Ticonderoga broke. <laughs> Now, believe it or not, this club is these clubs. They're still active today. They're still around today. Can you imagine? Are there new members? I don't think so. <laughs> so now, this folks is where it starts to get a little wonky for us. As time goes on, the people that were receiving these things, the wives, they start to die off. Even the daughters, and you know, start to die off a little bit. So all the all these people that collected and actually legitimately meant something to them, there's no market anymore. So in 2008. The global company realizes this, and they say, "Listen, we can't. We're not putting any new material out there. There's no more figurines. There's it's like no Billy more Joel. Billy Joel. <laughs> He's like, I'm done. Yeah. He's like, I'm just gonna tour. The Hummels can tour, do stadium tours. I can. We can talk about the Twink in the Tree and Lou with the with Mr. Toti and stuff. But I we're just doing back collection to to celebrate. That's when Mr. Toti came out and sang Good Night Saigon in honor of Billy Joel." <laughs> Um, I didn't start the Hummels. So after Goebel sen- sells it off, another company purchases it, and they and they try to keep it going, and that doesn't work. And then another company purchases it, and they continue to sell them. And 
any company that has it ever since she died, it's always watched over by the nuns that are in that convent. They're all part of this. They never have once left. Do you think do you think like at like normal jobs when they have like the district manager come in, like do you think the nuns go in? Like they have, oh great, Sister Mary Margaret's coming in. She's a real ball buster. Yeah, she's oh shit, she's a ruler. <laughs> she's just measuring the heights of the yeah. thumb. And then she hits your hand if you didn't get it right. And so obviously it's interesting because it's one of those markets that as time went on, the people that would purchase it, they just sort of died off. But I think you can draw a real link between the collection craze that our grandmothers had, right, Mm -hmm. to Cabbage Patch dolls, like I said, to Beanie Babies, to Funko Pops, right? Yeah, I have have no idea about those worlds. Ray, Ray, how many many pops do you have? Uh, Over 100. But look at I have I have Teen Wolf on a mushroom p- playing with Slimer. Good for you, Slimer! <laughs> Slimer getting slimed! So going forward now, it kind of seems like the annual production of figurines is gonna be reduced to about from like fifty five thousand to, to about twenty thousand. And there's gonna be no figurine right now that's smaller than ten centimeters um or less than like a hundred dollars is gonna be manufactured. When we come back, I'm going to give you some information on how if your Hummels in your grandma and aunt's house is worth anything and how you can figure out what's rare and what isn't. Are you going to have any information on how I can join one of the chapters? Yes. Now that I'm the president, you can just send in a membership card to me and you can tell me what your favorite Hummel is. What is your favorite Hummel? I would say Ludwig walking down the street while he's trying to get away from the Bobcat that's going to attack him. It's one of her earlier works. Yeah, from 1932. Great. I'll tell you some more information when we come back. This was a thing. This was a thing. And now, this is a sketch. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. As you know, the Hummel Company has, in the past few decades, been looking for a way to make its way back into the hearts and minds of a whole new generation, which is why we have asked our research and development director, Elisha Burton, to come up with some ideas to tap into the youth market. Elisha! Thanks, Tom. Uh, so uh, I'm a little older, uh, so I was a little uh, daunted <laughs> by this task, finding uh, hummels that the kids would like. But luckily, uh, my, my children were home from college, and I listened in on their conversations, their convos, their kikis, and I uh, got some good ideas. Uh, so here are a few of the new Gen Z hummels we will be releasing next year to coincide with the first day of classes at NYU. Uh, In your catalog, uh, this new one is Hummel 912, polyamorous Latinx child at an Occupy Wall Street rally. Hummel uh, 913 will be Berta, a body positivity advocate who is carrying an artisanal jar of mayonnaise she bought off an Etsy creator in Williamsburg. And she's also wearing an ironic Build-A-Wall t-shirt with uh, Pink Floyd uh, defecating in Donald Trump's mouth. Uh, and, and to celebrate 4th of July, we have Hummel 917, uh, whom has been asked to call mm, as uh, they do not feel they should have any name, as all names are an appropriation of other cultures. And finally, as we all know, the most sought after Hummels are those that have large groups in them. So we have created poly-ethnic Vassar students in a brave space validating their conscious biases while a cisgender teacher only calls on those from disenfranchised communities. So we are very excited to be bringing Hummels back for the new generation. Uh, Are there any questions? Yes, the young person in the back. Where are you from? Uh, My mother is from Canada and my father is from Lebanon. You do know that Hummels were created in Germany. Yes, I will be posting a very brave resignation letter today on my Instagram. Thank you very much and I look forward to being canceled. Thank you. This was a sketch. Okay, so... Most of them, just so you're aware, most of them actually sell for $50 or less because the market was so saturated from the 70s. They just were like, I I don't know like why they just decided, okay, we're going to say the Hummel figurines are worth something now. And like how that resurgence came back, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so most of them now, like I said, are, are, are $50 or less. However, if you do have Hummels in your house, 
here's a couple of things to keep an eye out for to see if they're actually worth money. So first of all, the bigger and more elaborate the piece, the more money you'll get for it. So larger, more complex pieces tend to be priced higher than the smaller figurines. Makes sense. Oh, yeah. If there's multiple children in the in the setting, that's obviously more than a single child. Obviously condition, right? Your, your piece has to be in good condition. But here's something I didn't realize. If you have the original box and packaging, it racks up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is all stuff I know. Rarity, obviously, is a big one. Retired and limited edition figures tend to be more valuable than figures being currently produced. You can go onto their website to see like what is still being produced. And then demand, which is obvious. And here are some things. So keep an eye out, folks, if you have any of these. There are figurines that every Hummel collector wants in their collection. Uh, one is called the Ma- Merry Wanderer. That's Hummel number seven. I'm looking for that, and I can't find it anywhere. And Stormy Weather. That's Hummel number 71. They both had many figures created, both Merry Wander and Stormy Weather. But since these figurines resonate with so many people, these timeless classics are usually priced for a few hundred dollars. Other more expensive figures in high demand are rare, including Ring Around the Rosy and Adventure Bound. That's numbers 348 and 347. Is the Ring Around the Rosy one actually showing what Black Plague was like? Because that was exactly. what Ring Around the Rosy exactly. was about, right? Now listen to this. Ready for this? Here, here we go, folks. Adventure Bound, right? Which is Hummel number 347. It is going on the Hummel website for $3,990. I found it on eBay for $250. Did you get it? Well, hey, your Christmas gift is coming up soon. Venture bound. That's all I want to do for Christmas. And then the year obviously plays a part into it. So obviously the older the model, the more valuable. Sometimes Hummels have an etched number that indicates the year on the underside of the figure. So turn the figure upside down, you'll see a year. What would 47 mean? It means that you didn't buy 46. If it does not have one, you can indicate the range of years by the official global trademark because the trademark changed over time and if you go to the hummel website you can match up the year all right so i want to read to you some of the hummels if i can that are expensive and why they're expensive number so we talked about this before adventure bound adventure bound adventure bound suggested retail price folks forty nine hundred dollars models with the full b stamp the full b stamp which was created before 1959. These rare versions can go at auction for anywhere between six to nine thousand dollars. Six to nine thousand dollars, folks. There's one called Picture Perfect, in which three children and a dog are sitting for their picture, taken by an old camera. This piece is highly valued because only 2,500 figurines of these were made. Hey, Ring Around the Rosie. This adorable figurine depicts four little girls playing a game of Ring Around the Rosie. The original figurines are taller. Suggested retail price: thirty-two hundred dollars. Schoolboys shows three schoolboys going over a lesson on a writing splate slating writing slate. It's especially valuable because this large size was permanently retired by Goebel. We have schoolgirls going for thirty two hundred dollars. Also rare because of the size forever, friends. Hey, that's like you and me. Aww. Goebel only made a thousand of these limited edition Hummels. And originally this Hummel came with a porcelain identification plaque. If you've got the plaque. You're making some money. What if I don't have the Hummel? Well, then get the fuck out of my life. But you have the plaque? I have the plaque. I'll give you a dollar. (laughs) Let's just talk a little bit about what its legacy was in pop culture. So more works of M.I. Hummel, Bertha, continue to be found in attics and elsewhere. Today, we know there's like roughly 600 paintings and drawings from her childhood and her pre-convent years as an art student. We also know there's another 700 of like her works from when she was in the convent. What's really cool is the royalties from the sales of these figurines still go to help the convent that she was a part of, which is really sweet. And one of the reasons I really like Sister Berta is because she was doing things women just were not doing at this time. You know, it was traditional at this time that she was showing her knees. She was showing her knees, number one. My God, I'm shocked. But like she was supposed to go be a wife and a mother And that was going to be her whole life. And she's like, no, I want to be an artist. So she goes to be an artist. She did higher education, which a lot of women in Germany were not doing at the time. She was an entrepreneur, right? She was literally making money. She also helped the convents with the contracts they were signing. So in some way, she's like, yeah, I know I'm not getting anything, but let me help you get the best deal. And then finally, she was political. For her to like say, listen, I think Nazism is wrong and I'm going to draw it. And then for Hitler to say, you can't do that anymore. And she's like, well, go fuck yourself. Here, I'm going to make an angel with a Jewish star on it. What do you want me to do? What did you say to me? So I think that every time you look at one of those figurines that's collecting dust on your grandma's shelf, 
it actually has a deeper and richer story to it than you ever could have imagined. If you want to see more Hummels up close, live, and living color in person. I do. Great. You can go to Germany, where Sister uh, Berta's sister, literal sister, actually created the Berta Hummel Museum. One of the children that was depicted in her work uh, created the Hummel Museum in Texas. And that, unfortunately, stopped being a venue in uh, 2001. Is that the Hummel with the kid with the cowboy hat? Yes. <laughs> it was the Hummel that flew Ted Cruz to Acapulco. <laughs> Now, one of the most fascinating Hummel museums to me is one in Rosemont, Illinois. There was a mayor there. His name was Donald Eve Stevens. This guy was mayor for like 30 plus years of Rosemont. He had one of the largest collections of figurines in the world. And when he died, he bequeathed the entire collection to the city of Rosemont. And you can go there whenever you want. And it's called the Donald E. Stevens Museum of Hummels. So I think the next time we go up to Illinois, Ray, I know that we are going to make a stop, take a look around. Somebody was saying to me, they were like, how do you explain this to a whole new generation of like what these figures meant? I don't know if a new generation would like the figurines. I'm sure they would. Fi- I mean, I think they would go, oh, it's, it's either too cutesy. It's t- the porcelain quality of it might not be something that's you know people want to actually play with i mean you can't really play with the dolls and like also like this is before plastic was really big and used and stuff but you know i would love for people to remember that yeah you might think they're too cute but the story behind the person who created it is so incredible to me and it's not just decoration it's political statements no yeah it's political statements and if you see that on someone's shelf it clearly tells you something about their history and what they were interested in And I think that's really, really cool. So that's it. That's the story of the Hummel. Ooh. Thank you so much. I hope you uh, enjoyed this. You want to play a game? Yeah. This was a thing and now it's a quiz. This is a this was a quiz. Mark Schroeder, welcome back. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So happy to learn about Hummels, uh, invented by Sister Mary, lovely, wonderful person who uh, unfortunately died of tuberculosis <laughs> in 1946. Thank you for doing your research. Just a little bit of a recap. <laughs> Just a recap <laughs> for anyone who might have forgotten. <laughs> who might have fallen asleep over the last uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, and it got me thinking about how many famous people have died of TB. And I was like, oh, this person, this person, this okay. person. Uh, and then as I was looking at people I thought of TB, I realized, oh, no, they actually died of of syphilis and i was getting those two confused in my head so coughing from different places very 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 different places so today's game is called tb or vd (laughs) okay you're gonna go separately here i'm gonna give you each five famous people through history that have died you're gonna tell me if they died of tuberculosis or if they died of syphilis okay yeah got it. who would like to go first i'll go first rob here are your five people former president james monroe he died of uh uh uh, tuberculosis correct vivian lee syphilis incorrect al capone syphilis correct edouard manet tuberculosis syphilis and anton chekhov tuberculosis tuberculosis is correct three of five three Three out of five. five ray okay oscar wilde tuberculosis incorrect Frederick Chopin. Tuberculosis. Correct. George Orwell. Tuberculosis. Correct. Charles Baudelaire. Oh, syphilis. Correct. And Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche's it's probably syphilis. Correct. Wow. Was that four of five? Yeah, you got four. Four out of five. Wow. Really knows his VD and his TB. If I didn't know the person, I just guessed syphilis. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good motto for people you meet in life, yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Just assume anybody you don't know intimately has syphilis and you'll be safe. That's a Hummel they should release, this, uh syphilis Hummel. <laughs> oh, no. Just somebody in detachable nose? Yeah. <laughs> it just... This is uh, Hummel 834. <laughs> uh, this is Bjorn has syphilis. Uh, if you notice, the... Uh, Porcelain figure is doubled over in pain with a syringe underneath his feet. Yes, <laughs> but that's what makes it worth the cost. They're so real. They bring. They're just timely. These Hummels. And if you don't like that, uh, eight thirty-five is called Brigitte makes a pie, and it's little Brigitte by the oven. <laughs> Also with a syringe at her feet. Also with a <laughs> syringe at her feet. All right, Mark, thank you so much thank for, you, Mark. for teaching us. Oh, uh, my gosh. Mark, I, I hope that your name was never on this list. Uh, mine was uh, questions 11 through 50. I understand. Thank you so much. We'll be sending you a, a Hummel through Venmo. Thank you. Or, or we'll, we'll ask uh, the Hummel company to make an original Mark Schroeder oh, Hummel. Oh, yeah. 
It'll be a It'll porcelain be the, figure holding a microphone. A very tall Hummel, though. Yeah, Mark, actually, how tall are you, Mark? 6'5". Six 6'5". Five. Six five. Yeah. Mark just looms over all of us. Mm-hmm. Mark can dunk. That's a cool thing. Mark can dunk. And you can buy Hummels if you go to the Hummel website and uh, get some. Uh, please, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram us. Let us know about your experience with Hummels. And uh, if your grandparents had any of them growing up. And if, because of this podcast, you make some money. Realizing that you've got a rare and valuable Hummel on your hands. And if so, we get 10%. You can oh, yeah. Venmo us. Patreon. Patreon. All right, friends. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks for listening to This Was a Thing. And a big thanks to the folks that keep this show running. Our editor, Daniel Cut Cut Schwartzberg. Our composer, Billy Better Than DC Reese. Our social media director, Gabe Hashtag Crawford. Our graphic designer, Natalie's Nothing Too Graphic DeSavia. And finally, our games coordinator, Mark the Shark Schroeder. If you liked what we did today, make sure to head on over to iTunes to rate and review us. The more stars you leave us, the more love we feel. Hey, speaking of love, show us some social media love. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at This Was A Thing Pod and Facebook we are This Was A Thing Podcast. Reach out, we'd love to hear from you. And if you really liked what we did today, head on over to Patreon.com and become one of our sponsors and you'll get access to special episodes, interviews, and merch. That's Patreon. Search This Was A Thing and support us so we can keep doing this show. Thank you.